Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon, morning, or evening to you, and welcome to A Reason for Hope. Sean Richards hosting today and joined by Peter Martin for our famous Apologetics Monday. This is A Reason for Hope, though, so note that the format overall has not changed. We've just reserved the first question of the broadcast to an issue regarding giving an answer for the reason for the hope that is within you. If you have any questions above and beyond that, or including that topic, hopefully, feel free to give us a phone call. We will be still taking those, not only today, but throughout this week, and looking forward to engaging with you on the matters of your heart and life. Maybe it's issues of biblical prophecy and matters of the future, what perspective we need to have looking forward, matters of biblical relevance to your life today, or clarification on biblical passages recorded many Christmases ago. Those are all welcome on the broadcast. Just make sure that they are sincere. You can send them along to us at our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. Give us a like and you'll be notified when we are going live, when you can join us not only face-to-face, but also join us on our archives if perhaps you missed a broadcast or want to revisit one where your question was answered but far too quickly. Also note our YouTube address, uh, Any Reason for Hope, is open and available for subscriptions. We will take advantage of that so long as we can. And our phone line is open at 1-877-556-1212, as well as our email address, questions for hope at gmail.com. I think that covers it. <laughs> so Peter, I uh, want to start us off in a word of prayer and we'll get right into our topic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Father, we are very grateful for your mercy, Lord, the way that you love us and care for us. And we pray that as we study your love right now, that it would be something that inspires us, that grows us in our ability to care for others, as well as our ability to uh, love and adore you, Lord. Please lead and guide this broadcast. I pray that all who are listening would be benefited by it, that they would grow in their understanding of you and in their uh, relationship with you, Lord, as a result. We love you, God, and in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, last week we talked a little bit about love, a more introductory form, and discussing that there are many ways that we can mean the one word that is love, and fortunately the language that the Old and New Testaments were written in did not uh, give us that sort of ambiguity. When they meant a certain kind of love, they used it with intention. Now, I want to go a little bit more into that. When the Bible's talking about love, especially in contrast to the way our culture uses love, more hiding behind ambiguity rather than standing on its confirmation, why is it so important that of all the terms used for love, the Bible chooses the ones that it does? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's very, very important. The, the type of language that the Bible uses is because what we talked about uh, it was actually two weeks ago because last week we were talking about Ravi Zacharias. But uh, a couple weeks ago, if you guys were listening to that broadcast, what we mentioned is that a lot of people in this world have a very malleable definition for love. Uh, they, they really couldn't nail it down to a singular definition. It seems to be different for different people. Uh, and therefore, and it seems to be really tied up with an emotional state primarily. Uh, and because of that, they it, it's hard to judge whether or not people are acting in a loving way. Now, uh, according to the Bible, to act in a way that is non-loving is actually sin. So Paul literally says to love fulfills, uh, love fulfills the law. That's Romans chapter 13. Well, what's the insinuation there? That if you're not loving, you're not fulfilling the law. You are breaking the law. You are sinning against God. So not only did they believe that love was concrete, but they also believed that love uh, inherently necessitated action and those actions would be in keeping with God's perfect character. That's why John in 1 John 4 verse 8 says God is love. Right, so the the words, uh, the language that they use and the verbiage that they use was very, very important for them. Now, we have a couple descriptions of what we call this agape love. We we talked about that a couple weeks ago. That in the Greek they had a divine word for love called agape, uh, which comprised the other three words, which are phileo, which refers to the love that you have for friends, storge, the love for parents towards their children, as well as the reciprocating love from children to their parents. Uh, as well as eros, which is a romantic kind of love. Uh, Agape was a supreme love, a divine love that 
encapsulated the other three as well as governed it. It completed them. It made them perfect. Yeah, all their strengths, but none of their weaknesses. C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, acknowledged that storge, or an act of affection, can have ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. Eros can be driven towards not only certain appetites, if you will, but also every appetite. You yeah. can eros food as much as you eros your spouse, but also noting as well, phileo and respect, that can have a skewed perspective or it can even blind you towards their character faults, mm -hmm. and they all have that weakness. What Agape was intending to do was to describe the kind of love that didn't have these sort of ulterior motives, right. and when Paul was speaking to a Greek audience, they knew about a love beyond themselves, beyond their ability and capacity capacity and he just simply pointed it out and saying that even though your culture didn't encounter God the ways ours had we both understand we're looking for something and it was him it was Jesus absolutely so uh, we're gonna we might get into it today we might save this for next week but today what I wanted to talk about was the idea of what is the character qualities of this love what does it look like now we, we said that the character of God mirrors this uh, this definition the reason why is because god's character literally is the grounding of love yeah he um, who knows god he who loves knows god because god is love that's right so it's not that god is loving meaning it's not that god has loving character qualities to him it's literally his character is the grounding for love uh which is a very different thing so uh if you want to understand love you obviously have to study god but uh, there are a couple places in the Bible that give kind of shorter definitions that comprise God's nature. Uh, the most notable would be 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Now, before I get into these qualities that most of us are familiar with, there's a couple things that we have to remember. First, when we get into this, is that no one is going to do this perfectly. Uh, the reason why is because if you were literally perfect in this way, you would be perfect altogether. Because if you love God perfectly and you love your neighbor perfectly, you are perfect. That's what the Bible says. Now, the other thing that we have to understand when we get into this is that what Jonathan Edwards called it, he used this really weird word, it's concatenation. Uh, no one really uses that word anymore. But basically what it means is he's saying, when you look at these descriptions, it's not that you can't do some of these things some of the time. He says what makes God different and distinct is he does all of these things all of the time and toward all people. That's the difference. That's in concatenation, meaning it's, it's comprising all of it together at the same time. You can't have one without the other when it comes to God. It's not like he does some of these things and then he ignores the others. He is doing all of them all of the time towards all people. We, on the other hand, like I said, we do better towards different people, but we're definitely not this way towards everybody, uh, first off. Secondly, we're not all these things toward anybody. Uh, we, we only hit some of the notes some of the time. Uh, I think Bo Ouellette, who does uh, guitar, and he's the assistant pastor at our church, he, he does a lot of classical guitar. If you ever see someone play classical, you notice that they don't strum. They pluck each individual note of the chord. And what Bo would say is he says that it, God strums, meaning hits all the chords at once, whereas we pluck, right? We hit some of them some of the time, but uh, we kind of miss some of the, the notes uh, on, on occasion. So l let's read through this description. Love suffers long and is kind. <clears throat> Love does not envy, does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So we see this kind of understanding of love. And like I said, it's not just one of these things. You can't just take one of these aspects and say, now you're loving. You have to do all of them. And what that means is that, like I said, none of us are really doing this perfectly, but we can get better. <laughs> we can't look at this and say, I'm improving. There's, there's ways that I'm doing better at this area or that area. And you should be seeing a multiple growth in your life, meaning that from multiple angles, God's spirit should be growing you in your capacity to do these things. So let's take this apart. Love suffers long and is kind. This sentence, some people take it apart, which they shouldn't. It is one statement. Love suffers long, which is another word for patience. Love is patient and kind. So some of us can suffer long, meaning that we sit in the DMV and we can sit there and we can play on our phones and do stuff like that. We can suffer long, but to remain kind is something unique. 
meaning in the process of suffering long, even towards the people who are making us suffer long, we remain kind and gentle towards them, right? So if you have, let's say, a child who is constantly uh, irritating you and bothering you, you simply being able to put up with it doesn't mean you're actually doing this character quality. What it means is while you're putting up with it, you're maintaining a heart of gentleness, kindness, generosity, and care for the person who's causing you that harm. Now, that's a simple answer, and I'm using this as just like being annoyed, but it also carries over to the idea of being actually hurt or harmed by somebody. Because remember, this kind of love is towards even your enemies who are seeking to harm you. So the perfect example of this would be Jesus being crucified and praying for the people who were killing him, right? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That would be Jesus suffering long, his crucifixion was long, and remaining kind throughout it, right? So he sought to save not only the people who killed him, but even the people who were mocking him, the thieves on either side. He ended up actually bringing one of them to salvation while they were mocking him. And you, you see this character quality very much played out within the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He suffered long, but he remained kind even towards the people inflicting the harm upon him. Any, anything you'd like to add to that? No, just clarifying that one main point. If you are in that state, you're not described as, in our uh, dynamite uh, illustration, long-fused, meaning that you can last a while before a temper or before a reaction. Up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, don't, you don't have a fuse. That's the point of this love. That's right. And, and you, it pairs very nicely. Like I said, there's a concatenation. There's a, there's a coming together of these, these, uh, these character qualities. It uh, pairs very nicely with the idea of is not provoked right? It's not provoked. So again, I could look at that and say, I'm doing a lot better. You know, I used to be, have like no fuse towards people and be very, very uh, cutting and, and wicked. Now I have a longer fuse, but I'm still very much failing in this area a lot of the ways. So uh, people can try my patience, but again, as they try my patience, their days are numbered. You know, like my, my patience will come to an end. I am not there yet in this area. As opposed to the contrast, when we see God, for example, in the Old Testament, even as he's judging Israel, he's reminding them, hey, I'm doing this because we not only made a covenant, but you're going to get worse if I don't stop here. Right. But I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to restore you. I haven't given up on you. So recognize that. It's not the presence of anger that negates love. It's the execution of anger that as provoked would suggest right. is a reaction to an action, not necessarily the uh, way God does it in that it's just the natural or the best thing to do. That's right. And, and again, in, in our culture, we tend to think of kindness or gentleness being at odds with anger or wrath, but the Bible doesn't see it that way. God remains gentle in his discipline, right? So uh, as it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 13, so there's this, I mean 12, there's this idea that God remains kind and gentle in the way that he executes his wrath. So uh, to put it another way, if I'm acting sheerly out of wrath, it's wrath devoid of love, that would be bad. And that would be my purpose of executing my wrath is to cause harm. It is to hurt that person, nothing else. Whereas when God executes wrath, the purpose is redemption. And eventually his wrath is going to be executed in such a way where it's going to not only satisfy his justice and preservation of his people, but it's also going to satisfy the free will of the person who decides to reject God, uh, which we're not going to get into right now. So, uh, unless you ask. Yeah, unless you ask. <laughs> uh, the next one, love does not envy. Uh, love does not envy. The idea here, and I have to kind of run through these a little bit faster because we're, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but the, the idea here is that uh, enviousness, when we think about jealousy or envy, what it could mean is it could mean that love isn't covetous, meaning that love is content. Uh, covetous would mean that you are dissatisfied with what you currently have and you're always longing for what you don't have. You believe that happiness is somewhere else. It's out there, it's over there where some with your neighbor's possessions or it's behind you with what you previously had. Uh, the idea is God is always content with what he has. He's not envious or lustful. Uh, another th way that you could put this when it comes to being jealous is that love is not possessive. Uh, God is not possessive of us saying that like either either 
I have you or no one has you, you know, like you can't go anywhere else. I will not give you free will. I'll not give you free reign. And if someone decides to leave God, he's pestering them all the time. He's, uh, you know, showing up in their dreams and he's constantly like, come back to me, come back to me, come back. You know, like that's not how God is. If you reject God, God will allow you to walk away. Uh, God is not that kind of petulant, jealous person. Uh, the next one says it doesn't parade itself. Love does not parade itself. What this means is it's not boastful. Uh, love does not feel the need to constantly inflame its own ego. Why? Uh, pride is our essential issue in uh, the biblical understanding, our capacity to think on only ourselves. Love is the ability to think on others. So because of that, love's primary goal is to benefit others and not self. So love is not engaged in parading itself or benefiting itself. Now, I don't have time to get into this. Maybe next week we'll talk more about this. This right here, just this one thing, makes God's love completely and totally distinct from human love. Human love at its core is to aggrandize self. Meaning that the reason why we love others at our core, in our flesh, not, not in our redeemed state, but in our flesh, the reason why we love others is to benefit self, is to benefit self in some, some way, either because we need people or because we desire to feel better about ourselves. We call this codependency. So I'm going to serve you and benefit you so that I feel like I have meaning in my life and I have significance in the way that I behave, uh, things like that. Or I just feel like that kind of a good person that I'm so loving and so kind. God doesn't do that. Uh, is not puffed up. This, this again, a idea of pride or arrogance. Love doesn't need to do that. Love feels very content with itself. It does not behave rudely, right? So love doesn't seek to offend other people. You could put it that way. Uh, so there are some places where love will offend uh, because love will offend when it needs to. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But at the end of the day, love's intent isn't to offend. So God would not be on Twitter is what we're saying there, I guess. Uh, but the intent there is not to offend. I, know, I just post <laughs> pictures on Twitter. But. <laughs> uh, love does not seek its own. Uh, this is like the, the main one for love. Love is not about self. Love is about others. Uh, does not, uh, sorry, is not provoked. We talked about that. Thinks no evil, meaning that there is a moral uh, side of love that love does consider the law, the love does consider the commandments of God. It's not that love is less than keeping the commandments. Love is more than keeping the commandments because it's not just keeping the letter of the law. It's keeping the spirit of the law. You're trying not only to do good to others, but you're trying to do good to others from the right heart, from the right motive, and for the right purposes. That's the idea of, of love. But yeah, there is a moral component to love that it thinks no evil, which again, we'll probably talk about this in the future coming weeks. This uh, coupled with a couple others would mean that the idea of the LGBTQ community saying love is love, the idea that, hey, we should just be supporting love. Love thinks no evil, meaning that love is always going to support the commandments of God. So if God says not to do something, to encourage somebody to do it would not be acting in love, right? No matter what that thing is. Because our ultimate good in life is to please God, is to glorify him. Anyone who brings you away from that purpose is not loving you. That's what this is saying. So people could disagree with that. They could say like, well, I don't like that or I don't, I don't agree with that. Fine. But that means that you're at odds with the biblical idea of love. You can come up with your own definition if you want, but you cannot pretend that you are simultaneously upholding God's view of love as well as your view of love. You have to choose one or the other. Uh, next, it does not rejoice in iniquity. Again, goes right along with this. There's a moral component to it, right? So there's no, I, there's no place for love to actually enjoy sin, to enjoy what goes beyond God's commands. There's a lot that I could say when it comes to human sexuality, when it comes to that one. But a lot um, of things concerning <clears throat> yeah, humanity. A lot of things uh, concerning humanity, and, and especially in the realm of sexuality, that would fil filter into that. Uh, but rejoices in the truth. And by the way, this is not just for homosexual or anything, heterosexual, right? All of us would, would fall into that category where there are things in our sensuality, what uh, essentially we like when it comes to sexuality, that go against God's commands and we rejoice in it, meaning we like it and are attracted to it. And that is against love. Which we're specifying not because we have a bone to pick or they're a punching bag, but because they're the most active modern political example of it. And thus you all understand us. Communication is the goal here. That's right. And very few people, by the way, uh, would contend that things like pornography are loving. 
um most people wouldn't be like yeah no porn is love like that's what love looks like like no one really argues that what the 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 reason why we would say this we would focus on that community is because they believe that what they're doing is in keeping with god's love right so or say for example someone who's living together with someone they haven't made an oath to before god and saying that no you see we're 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 living out this covenant before god even though we just haven't gotten a government piece of paper yet well remember we're supposed to honor the governing authorities and god not or that's right but note that point as well that justification or celebration of something other than or even deviant of what God would consider ideal. Right. I'll even throw one more out there. Uh, people who say that they are in a loving relationship with a non-believer, uh, this would be something that's iniquity. It's something that's against or contrary to God's purpose or someone, say, loving someone who's already married right, <laughs> or something like that. Right. So there's, we could go down the list and say, like, yeah, this is rejoicing in iniquity. You are celebrating and enjoying and delighting in something that goes contrary to God's word. Uh, next would be rejoices in the, but rejoices in the truth, meaning that it's not just the idea of loving the truth, which we could talk about, uh, in great depth. And I'll talk about it a little bit right now, but it's also the idea of rejoicing in the truth of God, rejoicing in the truth of his word and his gospel and his message. Note the contrast. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, but you could take it from the component of, uh, ignoring the contrast, which I don't like doing, but <laughs> ignoring the contrast and, and saying like, okay, well, there, there is a component where love or God delights in truth itself. Now, once again, this, is, this outs many of us, if not all of us. We all have biases that keep us from truth. Uh, and I'm not just talking about religious bias. I'm talking about political bias. I'm talking about uh, just basic prejudicial bias, meaning just not liking somebody, so not like, wanting to give them the benefit of the doubt. Emotional, social, moral. Yeah. Right. We all have these biases that make us not want to know the truth, uh, we want us to be ingrained in our version of truth as opposed to seeing objective values and objective truth, and that's a problem. Uh, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I'll, I'll run through these very, very quickly because uh, we've gone a little long. Uh, bears all things means that it not just puts up, but <laughs> puts up with everything. But it's the idea that it won't give up, right? God's love will never give up on somebody or in any situation. You can't exhaust love, in other words. Add to virtue perseverance, like Peter mentioned. Absolutely. So there's this persevering attitude or dimension to love where love will just never ever give up now the way that you love someone in a particular relationship might shift meaning let me give you an example if i have a child who's an addict it might look like me putting them out of the house right loving them might look like me putting them out of the house and saying like look i feel like you being in this environment is enabling to you it's enabling your addiction it's enabling your behavior i need to put you in a place where you will get help because you're not looking for it right so it might look different but it never gives up on that person it never goes to the place where you say i've given up on you i don't believe that you can change or anything like that that's the idea of bearing all things it also comprises the idea of hoping in all situations this is one of the most radical ones to me uh, I don't like to hope for things. I'm a cynic. I, I like to say I'm a realist, but that's just, it's not true. Uh, that's me deceiving myself. I'm, I'm a cynic. I, I tend to be a, a hardcore pessimist. And so because of that, not oh, entirely his fault, by the way, right. <laughs> right. I could get into my biography of why I'm like this, but at any rate, uh, when it comes to people, especially, I give up on them very, very quickly. Uh, the reason why I give up on them is because I don't like being rejected. I don't like wasting my time. I don't like persevering with people. It, it's not easy to do. It's easier for me to just give up on people and be like, it's just never going to work. They're just never going to get it. Um, I, I don't have time for this, right? And I could write people off very, very quickly. I don't hope for reconciliation or hope for restitution or hope for reciprocation from someone else because I don't want to put myself through that. And I always love the idea that Jesus, as one of his 12 disciples, chose Judas. Mm -hmm. that, that's radical. Uh, and even on the night of his betrayal, how does he greet Judas? He's not like, you traitor. You know, you come here in the garden with all these guards. You know, you knew what you were doing. You know, he could have totally treated him out like that. We wouldn't have thought anything lesser of Jesus for doing so. But he greets him as friend. Jesus, even to the moment of betrayal, hoped that Judas would not do what he did. Uh, even though he knew that Judas would do what he did, which is a radical, radical concept. And one of the, the people in my life that helped me understand this is um, my sister had a friend who 
basically adopted some children from the Indian reservation. And uh, at a certain point, after like two years of raising these kids as her own, the parents took the children back, basically, uh, which is really unfortunate. But that that happens. Uh, for any of you guys who do work out in the reservation, you know that that can happen and that does happen. So uh, my sister asked her, she's like, would you have liked to have known? right? Given how grieved you are that you just lost your children, would you have liked to have known that it was only going to be two years as opposed to a lifetime? And she said, no, because I know me. And I know that if I knew it was only two years, I would have only invested in those children as if they were temporarily mine and not eternally. And that was like a radical thing. In other words, what she's saying is I would have rather have hoped that these kids would have been with me forever than have known and given up hope because I wouldn't have loved them as sincerely as I had. So Jesus always loves us with sincerity, truth, and abundance because he always hopes that we're going to come back to him, that we're going to do the right thing, even though he knows we won't. That's yeah, crazy. That's, that's yeah. the risk because when we people, we are talking to people and we say, my hope is for you, hmm. we actually mean my hope is in you. Yeah. And when they give us fewer and fewer reasons to have hope, that hope runs out because they are the source. Jesus is capable of hoping in himself for you. Yeah. And that's why he doesn't give up on us even when we continually reject him. We see that throughout the history of Israel. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you guys have any questions about it, uh, you could ask in the comments. We'll talk more about it next week. Any, anything you'd like to add to, to that? Or? Yeah, I think I threw in my 40 cents worth. So. <laughs> awesome. I'm hoping this blesses you guys. It always blesses me to talk about it because it just convicts me to the hill. You know, I'm just like, oh, gosh, I'm not doing any of this. And <laughs> I, need to do, I need to do better. God convicts me, and it's a good thing. Uh, if you want more reading on this, we probably won't actually go through it. Go through Galatians 5, uh, verse 22. Uh, the fruit of the spirit. These are also aspects of love. That's why the word there is singular, the fruit of the spirit. And then he gives a list. Um, he could have said the fruits, but he doesn't. He says the fruit. Why? Because the fruit of the spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those other things. They comprise love, if that makes sense. And developing that in a practical way. Second Peter one is also fantastic. Yeah. Um, got a question from Michael who wants to know if we think the modern English version, the MEV, is solid. Um, yeah, Michael, as much as any other translation we'd recommend for personal Bible study, the modern English version is a completely legitimate source for that and for two reasons. Uh, first, when we're talking about Bible translations or Bible versions, we need to make sure we clarify with people that stigma of saying you have all these different Bibles. No, we have one Bible just presented in two different ways ways. There's either translations or there's commentaries. And I say commentaries almost disrespectfully to the translators because that's what's referred to as dynamic equivalence or a paraphrased right. translation. Uh, when people provide that, they're basically just reprising the Bible as if they were speaking. This is what I think that the point was trying to get across as opposed to a word-for-word -word translation where instead of looking to the meaning from my perspective, I'm going to the language and basing it off more information rather than less. Uh, for those of you who are familiar at least with the King James only ism, it's a counter and a Unfortunately, a very radical counter to the idea of the confusion found in these two different forms of translations. So people wanting stability just choose the version that's most familiar to them, and they'll radically oppose any other view or any other presentation of scripture than theirs, even at the expense of truth. Now, when people do this, again, it's noble-minded, which is the case for most evil, but when we're talking about the issue, um, the King James translation is another example of word for word, but it was produced in 1611 AD. That's, for those of you counting, 409 years, or 410 years now, ago from the time of this recording. A lot and I mean a lot of extra evidence and textual manuscripts have been discovered to verify not just what the Bible said before the time of Jesus, but specifying the sort of things that we really need to know if we're going to present it in the whole truth. It doesn't mean to say that uh, people in the uh, 12th century, for example, didn't have the word of God, but it is saying that we were able to get a clearer version <coughs> from the translations than we had in the past. Now, why do I not hesitate to say that and not uh, throw all of your guys' faith under the bus because every single translation 
clarification is on the presentation of the words, not what the words themselves were communicating. Uh, for example, ambiguity is something that you can twist to the favor of a cult. But if on the other hand you're in a position of well, it's not really ambiguous. I just would rather know whether or not this verse actually belongs in my Bible. John, uh, I believe, uh, five four is a big, very controversial one because they don't find it in a lot of the early manuscripts. Uh, the long ending of Mark, the uh, woman caught in adultery, and so forth. These passages in the New Testament where we wonder not. Is it a corruption or is it an addition to Scripture? But do we have more evidence to support and justify it being in Scripture? That is some of the progress that's been made in the discoveries from 1611 to when the MEV was translated. That work was finished in 2013, so it's about seven years old as opposed to 410. Now, obviously, uh, we have our preferences. I personally like the New King James Version simply because that's the one I've spent the most time in. So if I'm in a Bible and even a word or two is reintroduced or reorganized, I feel thrown off, not because the message is different, but my preference. Uh, likewise, people who are more rigid in those sort of positions and saying like, no, this this is the translation for me. God bless you. I'm glad you're in your Bible. That, that doesn't need to be an issue that we combat each other on. But uh, Michael, for your question for its own sake, the MEV I would completely recommend. I think that their translation team did a great job. And again, cult groups are going to be cult groups. They'll always find a way to twist passages. But uh, just so uh, the audience is given a few examples. Here's some uh, hopefully familiar passages to all of you that are in the MEV. Uh, in John 8, 58, you know, the New King James translate this, surely, surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They introduce the word before Abraham was born. Now, that's obviously clarifying in modern language the emphasis in the Greek that was clarifying from the time of his existence I have always existed. Now, you'll have to clarify that in theology, but the language is more clear, not less. Uh, likewise, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, notice some translations say everlasting life. Uh, some would say whosoever, as opposed to whoever. The differences are negligible. <laughs> so these are uh, so just some examples. And, and again, uh, here's another great one. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. So literally the same as what we would be most familiar with. If you uh, have an MEV, then I won't condemn you as a heretic. And if you don't, then God bless you. I'm glad you're reading your Bible. But uh, just clarifying the two types of translations, this is the better half. This is the one that looks at the most information we have, compares it to all the different copies that have been made throughout history, notes, okay, was that an error or mistake? Okay, here's some ambiguity. What do we have here? Let's do more information, not less, and let's present it in light of modern language. So I think that was a fantastic work that they did, and I fully recommend it. If uh, more information comes out that's controversial, we'll address it. But from what I know, uh, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Would you? Nah, I, I don't know anything about it, but I mean, it's, it seems like a solid translation. There are only three translations that I warn people against. Uh, the New World Translation, the Joseph Smith Translation, and the Passion Translation. <laughs> uh, if you stay away from those three, you're doing okay, in my opinion. <laughs> if, if, if more come to come to light, I will let you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, just note those points. The New World Translation, of course, for to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the first in history deliberate mistranslation to fit with a different theology. Joseph Smith Translation, I don't know what they were doing with even that. Even Mormons are offended <laughs> by that one. Because, <laughs> and yeah, then the Passion great. Translation makes even dynamic equivalents blush with yeah. the way it mishandles text. But yeah. anywho, <laughs> that being said, um, here's a question we received by email. Uh, this is from Dave that he wants to know, what does the Bible say about remembering the day, like calendar-wise, that you gave your life to Jesus? Is that important to deduce down to the Gregorian calendar, <laughs> or is it the fact that you started this day abiding in Jesus? Uh, yeah, no, it, it doesn't say anything about knowing the actual date uh, that we gave our life to Jesus. Um, knowing the circumstances, knowing uh, kind of when it happened, abouts and all that stuff, that's all important. So what we see uh, when we encounter people, what we call their testimonies, uh, the apostle Paul gives us the, the, the most exclusive testimonies that we see in the new Testament. What you notice is that he never gives a date. He doesn't say, Hey, on this date at the 
third of Nissan or whatever, you know, like this is when it happened. You know, he never gives a date. He, he gives the circumstances. He was going to Damascus. He gives what it was like encountering Jesus, things like that. But you know, you don't get a date. There, there's nothing in the Bible that would signify that we need to have a particular date. I couldn't give you the date. Uh, that I became a Christian. I could give you the circumstances. I could tell you what was happening in my life, what led up to that moment when I made a clear decision. The only time where I would say that you might want to check yourself, check your heart, uh, because I'm not saying this can't happen, but you'd have to have an extraordinarily bad memory for this to happen. If you can't remember ever making a decision to give your life to Jesus, I would say that that's bad. I would say that that's bad news. Uh, if you can't ever remember a time where you were like, yeah, no, Jesus is, is Lord of my life, that that's really odd and strange. I'm not saying definitively it can't happen. Maybe you grew up in the church and it was just like this gradual thing, but it's it's very odd to me. And uh, the, the way that you could determine that in your heart, though, very easily is just saying, hey, do I believe that Jesus died for my sins? Do I believe he rose again? Uh, uh, the third day and all these things. I believe in the authenticity of scripture and the inerrancy of it. Uh, I believe that because of these things, I will inherit eternal life and be forgiven for my sins against God. Right. So if you, if you could say with an honest heart that you believe those things and you've forgotten a moment where you agreed to those things, I, I find that strange <laughs> because of what a life changing moment that is. But hey, it, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I don't think you should feel terrible if that if you cannot remember um, a specific time, I, I think that's very strange, but I don't I don't think that's something you need to feel condemned by as long as you could agree with the, the tenets of Christianity. Yeah, if you're in a marriage relationship, I'm sure that sort of mindset might click with you a little bit because dames, for whatever reason, they like it when you remember exact dates, <laughs> birthdays and anniversaries are two examples. <laughs> but no, uh, as far as your relationship with Jesus, uh, he, he came to this world as a man and he retained that trait. He doesn't care about dates. He just cares about the fact yeah, that- Yeah, the Holy <laughs> Spirit's not going to grip you if you don't remember the anniversary. You know? And I'm being, yeah. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> it's not exclusive male traits or superior to women. And I'm making the point that if it's ultimately your relationship with Jesus, don't say, oh, that day was the day I gave my life to Christ. Start your day and say, God, let me abide in you. That's what's going to be most important. All right. Um, here's a question we received by email as well. This is regarding Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. At various times and in various ways, God spoke in times past to our fathers by the prophets, but it has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Um they conclude that the gift of prophecy was given to our ancestors. Not exactly what the text was saying, but I see your point. Um, is prophecy still practiced today? Yeah, that's an uh, interesting position that some people would not necessarily divide fellowship over, but differ on because not necessarily of the evidence in Scripture, but the abuse. Right. When people say, oh, I'm a prophet of God, or I, I have a new revelation from the Lord, let's add these uh, commentaries like Ellen G. White to Scripture, or let's uh, add a whole new series of books to Scripture like Joseph Smith, or say this organization serves as a prophet of God, and therefore they and they alone have the right to interpret Scripture like the Jehovah's Witnesses. People respond to, much like with our translation issue, abuse and error in one department with abuse and errors in the right. other yeah. direction. <laughs> and we don't want to err on either side. We yeah. want to make sure that we're on the actual side of truth. So when people say, okay, uh, has the gift of prophecy ceased? Well, you have to specify what you mean by that. Because if what you're referring to is the ability to reveal inspired scripture, the office of a prophet in the capacity that you are contributing books to the Bible, we'd say yes, but there's scriptural reference to that, which we'll get into in a moment. Mm -hmm. If you say, oh, well, the gift of prophecy as far as the Holy Spirit enabling someone to share God's word for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the church. Also a biblical definition, by the way. Well, that, that means that the church is kaput because right. that means no one can teach the Bible anymore. Right. So what, what do you mean by that? Uh, if on the other hand, in prophecy, do you mean that no one can speak on behalf of God anymore? Well, remember that was as much true in the Old Testament as the New. If God spoke, it didn't necessarily mean it had to be written down. Right. So you can clarify with people who are perhaps burned out, if not even damaged, by false prophets and say, well, let's just stick to Scripture because these people weren't frauds. Mm. And that's what you can fall back on. But when it comes to uh, properly defining prophecy in that sense, and we can go more into the 
uh, former definition regarding someone speaking to reveal scripture, why that right. ceased. Right. But if we're talking about someone teaching the Bible, uh, you want to take them to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where the definition of prophecy is specified by the Apostle Paul. Notice, this isn't in the Old Testament where you're like going, well, look, the priests offered these sacrifices in these ways. Why would they go into such detail if this wasn't relevant for all people at all times? Because the passage says it was for the Levites. But that being said, Paul makes this specification in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, and clarifying when we say prophecy, this is what it means. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. This is verse 1, 1 Corinthians 14. But especially that you may prophesy. Now that's a pretty much ongoing imperative for the church. Unless, of course, he only meant this for a century or two. Mm. No, he says that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue, so communication is the objective point here, does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, so note, here's the other example. We have tongues and we have prophecy. Uh, he who prophesies speaks, oh wait, uh, skip the line there, um, speak to men, but God no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies, here's the contrast, speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So the audience being the church, the purpose, edification, exhortation, and comfort, and the source, the spirit. Mm. Likewise with the tongue. What's the focus? What's the audience? Yourself. What's the purpose? Edification. And, of course, what's the source? The spirit. He makes both cases. But if you're to say that neither can function, the spirit isn't working through these things, yourself has no right to be edified by the spirit of God, which we'd also disagree with. And, of course, Put down the wrong finger there for a second. My apologies. <laughs> but when we're talking about that issue, uh, edification, exhortation, comfort, speaking on behalf of or in the name of God, those are things that the, the Holy Spirit is capable of doing today. And we see it practiced not only throughout Acts, but also into and ongoing in the present day. Things that we can test and verify. Well, hopefully what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about the other stat? Why would we say that in the sense of speaking scripture, that has ceased? And how would we justify that biblically? Yeah, actually, the Hebrews 1 passage is a great place to go <laughs> to show that the office of prophet has ceased. Um, because <clears throat> when you look at the purpose of the prophets of the Old Testament is God had not given a formal um, manifestation or revelation of himself. What he had done instead is he had revealed, and the, the language of Hebrews is actually really cool, various times and in various ways. Uh, what it means is that he, uh, another way to translate that is that God revealed himself in pieces, in essence. He didn't give a full revelation of himself in the Old Testament. Why wouldn't he do that? Because he was waiting to give a full revelation of himself in the person of Jesus Christ. This at is what, the opportune and proper time. At the opportune and proper time. This is what John meant when he said in John 1 verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known or exegeted him, right? So the purpose of the Son coming was to give the full and total revelation of God to mankind in that place. So the prophets were people that God spoke to at various times and in various ways in order to give them pieces of a revelation of who he was and what his plan for humanity was. But he waited until the revelation of his son to give a full understanding of who he was and what he was all about. And then he entrusted apostles to take that revelation and to communicate it to the church down through history, uh, whether it was through word of mouth uh, or what they actually wrote down in their letters and in their um, historic biographical uh, compilations of his life, death and resurrection. But uh, regardless of how you look at that, the apostles were not prophets in that sense, meaning that God wasn't directly revealing things to them as they wrote, like Isaiah and Jeremiah. Instead, what had happened is they had been witnesses to the revelation of Jesus Christ in his life, death, and ministry. And therefore, they then wrote those things down and then understood and interpreted the Old Testament through that revelation and therefore gave that interpretation in their letters. But they weren't like the Old Testament prophets. Be th therefore, what we understand is that when Jesus came, the office of prophet ended. As a matter of fact, 
Prior to Jesus coming, there was a 400-year silence until the final prophet came. The final prophet was John the Baptist. He was the final prophet that God would give. We no longer have that office. Because of that, what you don't have is you don't have people who could speak infallibly for God at all times. You're just not going to have that. What instead is going to happen is that people can have the gift of prophecy. I think it's more rare uh, today than people would think. I think it's actually a very rare gift when it comes to the, the strict one, right? There's the broad one that Sean gave, which would be the uh, ability to give edification, exhortation, and comfort through the word of God to the people of God. But there's also the narrow definition where you're getting specific uh, information from God about future events, which we do see happen in the New Testament. Uh, most notably, when Paul is going to Jerusalem, he encounters several prophets who tell him what's going to happen when he gets there. And Paul's like, great, that's what I want. You know, I'm, I'm going to share the word. I'm not going to let this deter me. But you do see people telling Paul accurate future events before they happened, and they end up happening. So we do know that that gift has not ceased. It is something that exists. I do think it's more rare. Uh, I think in the apostolic age, it was more widespread for reasons that me and Sean talk about a lot the authenticity of the message of the apostles and all that. But um, today it hasn't ceased. It exists. It's just it's just much more rare. And I always bring people to the George Whitfield story. So George Whitfield, for those of you guys who don't know, was a really, really prolific pastor during the Great Awakening. And uh, he, he was up there. He was one of the, the most well-known ones, very talented orator and all that. He ended up having a son and uh, his wife was named Elizabeth. And he firmly believed that this son was going to have a ministry very much like John the Baptist. So uh, when he got up, he actually gave a word of prophecy one Sunday morning. And he said, my son is going to be like John the Baptist. He's going to turn the hearts of fathers to the children, children to their fathers. And he, uh, 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 gosh, what, what's that word? Not baptized his son. He, uh, what do you do with it? Dedicated, dedicated his son to this ministry and that purpose uh, in front of the congregation. The problem was about two months later, baby John unfortunately passed away. And he, later on, he actually had to give up and give an apology to his congregation. He said, I took something that should have been merely tragic and I turned it into an occasion for many to lose faith. And he apologized for it. And he, he basically said later in his journal that he, he needed to be on guard for the ways that Satan could deceive. And he said, I took my natural desires as a father to see my son succeed. And I took a vision and a dream for his life and I turned it into the word of God. And he talks about how wrong that is. So in other words, get him killed with rocks at one point in history. <laughs> yeah. So it's important for Christians, unless you're absolutely certain that God has spoken to you to speak. It, it's okay. Like if you have a strong feeling that, Hey, like God, I, I just feel like God has asked me to share this with you, but don't say, I know that God has told me to do this. I am speaking in the office of God, unless you know, for a certain God has to come, confirm that message he's going to do it more in just like a dream or in a strong feeling he's going to do this in very specific ways and you'll know for certain if it comes true so if you're going to communicate so if you really feel which just happened that does happen that the holy spirit's laying something on your heart you feel like you need to tell someone something or you need to do something be careful hold it with loose hands for sure and see what happens and i get this question all the time i know scott does as well as well as you sean of why doesn't God instruct us more? Uh, There's so many times people come up to me and they say like, you know, well, uh, I have this big decision coming up. What does God want me to do? And uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna get to that in one second. So they'll say like, what does God want me to do? They have this big decision and uh, you know, you point them to the word and they'll say like, well, you know, like that, that I, I know that this decision isn't sinful. So like, let's, let's say, here's an example that I get a lot. Um, there's this person that I've been dating for a while. I feel as though we should get married. Am I called to be married? Is this what God wants me to do? And, you know, I could pull out passages that show that marrying someone is a good thing. You know, I could show, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about, you know, uh, treating the, the the virgin, which would be the, the unmarried person in a correct and proper way. I could show them those things, but none of them get them to the place where I, where I would say God directly wants you to marry this specific person, no one else, right? There is only one person on this earth that you could possibly marry. That's them. You have to marry them. And if you don't marry them, it's a sin, right? I can't get them there. That's where they want me to get them. And essentially what I end up saying to people is when they say, well, I just want to do the will of God. I say, no, you want to make a decision without thinking. And beyond wanting to make a decision without thinking, you want to make a decision without consequences. Because if you make a decision and things go bad, you could always just say, well, God told me to do it, right? It's not, it's not my fault. You know, God told me to do it. So I'm just being faithful. You know, 
what we need to do, what the Bible wants us to do is act and behave in wisdom, right? So when we hold the Bible, we're not just saying looking at the morality of the Bible. We're also saying looking at the wisdom of the Bible. God wants you to be wise. That's why he has an entire book dedicated to wisdom. That's why Scott has the Proverbs challenge. If you're up against a, uh, a difficult point in your life, open the book of Proverbs anywhere you want and start reading for five minutes and see if there isn't at least one proverb in there that directly applies to the situation that you're in right now. God can, he reserves the right to directly tell you what to do, but he doesn't tend to do that. It's rare. It's very rare. The reason why it's so rare is because God wants us wise. You who are his parents, you know, if you told your kid what to do in every circumstance, in every situation, you would be making them, hopefully, if you're making right decisions, they would be making right decisions, but they would be a fool. They would have no idea why they're making the right decisions. They wouldn't be educated in how to think. They wouldn't know how to defend their situation, and they wouldn't know how to persevere. They would only know how to do things if you tell them to do it. God doesn't want us to be foolish. He wants us to be wise, which means that he can't tell us directly what to do in every situation. Otherwise, we will be fools, right? So God can do it, and we see it in the Bible. He does it. But even in the people that God used most powerfully, very rare, very rare. Um, I mean, just I'll throw a name out there for you. King David. I can maybe count five times where God directly spoke to David in the entirety of his life. That's, that's pretty radical. And King David, I hate to say it for you out there, if you got a very inflated ego, he was used more powerfully than you will be, right? I could just, I could say that with pretty much confidence, right? He was used more powerfully than you will be, more powerfully than I will be. God spoke to him directly about five times in five specific areas of his life, giving him direct uh, instruction. Two of which were getting slapped upside the head. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So we shouldn't expect God to be giving us these kind of things all the time. We should want to grow in wisdom. But part of growing in wisdom is saying, God, you reserve the right to, to instruct me in whatever you, way you want. I want to be open to that. But I don't want to demand that I won't do something unless you directly tell me to do it. That, that's wrong. That would be uh, tempting the grace of God. Yeah, it's like the mindset of, oh, well, uh, school hasn't prepared me for life. I don't know how to do taxes. I don't know how to, uh, you know, pay a mortgage on a house. I just know that the Pythagorean theorem <laughs> is a thing and that uh, the uh, mitochondria is the power of the cell. Well, don't be so quick to condemn modern education, though we may have more reason than we used to. The point of those things was to help train you to think in steps, to work within a fixed system. And in the same way, the Bible's purpose isn't to just give you an answer and the easy way out, as you said, to not think, mm -hmm. but to encourage thought, to right. show throughout history, these people trusted God and weren't disappointed. They went through some stuff, but they weren't disappointed. Now, does this apply to you? Your turn. What, what are you going to do with this information? <laughs> That's the point being made. So, no, we wouldn't say the gift of prophecy has ceased. We should certainly have a high metric and standard for it, right. judge it based on what we already know. Right. But uh, I'll just read this passage because yeah. it's the main one, right? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So you can't despise something that isn't allowed anymore. Right. <laughs> but if on the other hand, or you can despise something, but that so implies that, that it's be, not yeah. despised. So <laughs> that being said, I got a question from Jay who wants to know, is John 1, 3 saying that when a child of God sins, he no longer is a child of God? I believe you're referring to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6. Uh, you can clarify that with us because... First John 3 is talking about Jesus sharing attributes as the creator. Uh, you can clarify with us if we're off, but let me read the passage I think you're talking about. First uh, John 3, and I'll start in verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. This will be vital in answering your question, John. Or uh, Jay, excuse me. Uh, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, people will not necessarily even stop right there. They'll take the second half of that verse and say, okay, therefore, if I sin, I've neither seen him nor known him. If I don't know him and I haven't seen him, then I don't have him. If I sin, I don't have Jesus. Well, here's the problem. 
not only in the same book, chapter 1 and verses 8 through 10, makes the assumption that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. But yeah. if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, meaning not only trustworthy, but fair in doing so, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The book doesn't get past the first chapter without A, admitting we're going to sin, that, by the way, the second chapter starts with that, too. Yeah. Uh, I've written to this to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, <laughs> we have an advocate with the Father. John's yeah. realistic in all this, but note, he's building on that point. Your status and relationship with Jesus is you're no longer a sinner. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that in my flesh I no longer sin? Apparently not. But if, on the other hand, I say, is my relationship before God seen as no longer a sinner? Well, how does he classify that? One who abides in Jesus. Hmm. Well, what's Jesus? Verse 5. And you know that he was manifested. So this is the reason he came to this world in the way that he did. To take away our sins. He can't take away something that's not already there. And notice this as well. And in him, in him, there is no sin. Let me say that again because it is just that important in not only getting over this bad theology, but maintaining good. In him, there is no sin. Whoever abides in him. Hmm. So notice, in him, there is no sin. If you abide, what's that word mean? To be in or to be near or consummated with. Yeah, to be comfortable in, right? Yeah. To set up your tent there. So if I'm in Jesus, I have no sin because in him, there is no sin. Hmm. If I'm in him, I don't sin. Right. <laughs> and that's the point. Now do I say, oh, so if I sin then, I'm not in him. No, remember how p chapter 5 presents it. He who abides in him does not sin. Hmm. What is the point being made? That you can't sin and abide in him? No. In fact, the reason why you sin is because there is still a separation from him. But in what capacity? Right. Not relationally, because that's what he came here to do, to take away our sins. Hmm. But is it functionally? Yeah, that's why it's called sanctification. And that's why we need to specify the difference. Absolutely. And there's another passage that goes very nicely with this. So as Sean said, it is possible if you eisegete that passage, if you only take that passage and you don't read any of the rest of John's letter to say, this means that once you're in Jesus, you will never sin again. But when you take the book as a whole, you realize that that interpretation is invalid. You cannot possibly hold that interpretation as well as read 1 John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 2. It doesn't work. Which um, is preceding John chapter 3. Right. <laughs> so the other way to look at it is the way that Sean's saying, and that is that as we abide in Christ, we don't sin. But if we, if we walk away from him, if we move away from him, we will. This pairs nicely with uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So as I'm walking in the Spirit, I'm not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. But, John, but Paul and John are not saying that I won't ever not walk in the Spirit or abide in that way. Want to resist sin? Follow Jesus. When you sin, come back to Jesus. Yeah. Welcome to the Christian life. God <laughs> bless you. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.